OK. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is a session on an overview of cloud audit support for OpenStack. My name is Brad Topol. I'm a distinguished engineer at IBM. And I've got uh, several friends up here with me. Uh, Gordon Chong is a corn salometer. And we have Matt Rakowski, who does some of our standards work. He's a DMTF co-chair for our cloud audit group. And we've got Rob Basham, who's on our uh, cloud system software side. So here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover, why cloud auditing is uh, important. We're then going to talk about some standards work that we lead in this area. It's called CADF, and we've gotten it integrated into OpenStack. Uh, and so we'll cover that. We're then going to show a demo of how this stuff can be utilized today benefiting from a standardized format. Uh, and then we're going to finish off with some future directions. So why is cloud auditing important? Um, raise your hand if you already feel cloud auditing is important. All right, that's a lot of hands. Um, and did you hear today uh, with Glenn Ferguson, who was at the keynote, talking about Wells Fargo, and he mentioned compliance, compliance, compliance. How you get compliance is by having good auditing mechanisms. And so there's a lot of reasons why auditing is important. You know, if you look at enterprise customers, they expect to be able to audit things. It's just sort of table stakes. It, it needs to be there. And if you look at your customers, you need to prove to them that unauthorized people aren't getting access to their, you know, their resources and their data. And finally, of course, you know, again, like what Glenn mentioned, uh, compliance regulation and all these real scary terms where people go to jail, HIPAA and FISMA and all kinds of things. So you really need to look out for that. So you know, to build that trust with the customers to want to use these clouds, We've got to be able to do trust and verify. We've got to be able to show validation. And that all comes down to having good auditing records and having the ability that automated tools can leverage those auditing records and be able to do great things. And if you look over here, OpenStack, there's so much going on, even at the lower level layers, usage of resources, authentication, role authorization, and then at the business application layer, lots of interesting things happening as well. We need a model that supports um, auditing at, at all those layers. And things get even more interesting when you start thinking hybrid cloud, right? So now you're running, and you're running in your private cloud, and then you're going to say burst up to a, to a public cloud. You really don't want to hear that, well, you can keep track of the stuff in your enterprise, but you can't keep track of the stuff up there in the sky because they're all using totally different auditing formats. That would be bad. So it's critical that for all the things that you want to audit, and there's lots of stuff listed here, um, that we have a standard format. And there's a lot of great reasons to have a standard format. Obviously, being able to work in all these different mixed cloud environments is, is one reason. Um, and, and this needs to be something that benefits the customers. The customers should just expect that there's a standardized audit format and they don't get vendor lock-in. They should be able to use one OpenStack environment and the auditing's there and it works with their tools that, that, that absorb the auditing and you know, create a dashboard and what have you. And we're going to show a demo of that. Um, you know, you don't come and say, you know, come to my cloud because I've got better auditing. It, it's really a place where an open standard plays a role. And from an IBM perspective, I, I want to talk to you about our strategy for how we do standards. What we do is we have somebody who's influential on the standard, like Matt Rakowski, who's a vice chair. And then we have somebody who's in the OpenStack world who's influential, like Gordon, who's a Solometer core. And we get these guys working together. So we bring in the developers, and we've done this for a lot of standards, and we get them throwing tomatoes at the standard. This is what sucks. This is what stinks. This is what's bad. Then the standard teams, you know, after they stop crying and you know, put down all the Kleenex, they then come back with a new iteration of the standard. And over a while, what happens is the standard becomes incredibly relevant 
because it's already been uh, validated by the OpenStack community. So that's really why we look at it, and having a standard uh, format makes a lot of sense. To go into more detail on this standard that we've got permeated through OpenStack, which is called CADF, I'm going to bring up Matt to come talk about it. Thank you, Matt. So all these problems outlined in compliance, um, even before IBM became heavily involved in OpenStack, we, we saw this coming. We saw from our customers that they wouldn't move over to cloud unless we provided them this, some standards to rely upon when they went to cloud, whether it be IBM's cloud or another cloud. And it just so happened that the DMTF uh, and the memberships there, there had a great understanding of managing large data centers. They did management of all the way down to low-level devices and things and large data centers, and, and they were w exploring the cloud space and how do we carry this for in cloud. And so we went there and we started a standard called CADF, Cloud Auditing Data Federation Standard, uh, because this data has to be federated. We understand that people are going to have these models that Brad described, hybrid models. People want to change clouds or pick the cloud best for their workload application. And this data needs to be shared and normalized in a way so that no matter what source it comes from, it can be brought together, aggregated, and analyzed um, to perform things like security intelligence, but things more advanced than that. We're going to talk about later on with Rob Basham, some future directions for, for CADAF and OpenStack to do some very things, very, uh, things with analysis and intelligence, business intelligence, workload intelligence, things like that to do corrective actions. So this is not just something that happens when things go wrong. This is to analyze what's going on in your environment to optimize it as well. Um, in terms of work products and resources we've created, um, we, we have a specification that when we became involved in OpenStack prior to Havana, we were actually getting ready to release a 1.0 standard. But we, set, we, we were called upon by our product team saying, hey, this kind of stuff looks like a good fit in, in OpenStack. So we kind of paused the standard, and we learned from our experience in, in implementing CADF and OpenStack and some of the requirements. And we actually are now ready to publish, uh, after two releases of OpenStack, Havana, and Icehouse of experience with CADF, a final CADF specification 1.0, which will be out in June. And also, in, in conjunction with that, we've created a profile. So you'll, there's actually a draft profile that describes all the things we did in terms of mapping events in OpenStack from every project from Nova to Keystone and how they would be, appear in, in, in CADF format. Um, we also have created an open source uh, library called PyCADF. It's actually bound into Oslo Messaging. You'll see the architecture chart thrown up later on. Uh, but it's reusable any place. Any time you want to use CADF, either, even outside OpenStack, you have a library of open source to draw upon to, to create that standard. Oops, that's the wrong direction. So why is CADF important? Uh, CADF is important because it's probably an event model. So people you know, think of auditing, they think of logs. They think of, I'm going to toss a timestamp here, I'm going to throw an ID here, I'm going to put an IP address in this thing. What do you get when you try to combine logs of, of, of different people creating from different projects? You get spaghetti, you get a big mess. It's not an overall problem anymore. We need to create better data. How do we do that? We have to tell people, give them a framework and a model for supplying the data when they put it into a format, and that's what we've created in CADF. So we have a, co a conceptual model where we talk about and define things like the actual event, and we tell people how to record actors that play a role in creating the event, who initiated it, what was the target, who is the observer, and that's what the key feature is that there's like a lot of confusion about an agent that observes the event versus the actual thing that the event was against. So we, we clarify those things in CADF and give prescriptive ways to fill out the data. And we do it in a way also that allows you to do very precise things. You can fill out some very basic things if that's all you have. But in the future, you can do some very sophisticated things. You can do ISO uh, geolocation information. You can record XYZ coordinate systems. You can do uh, regional uh, capture for ICANN region codes and things like that. We've always had an eye forward to doing things at, at a national level, NIST standard, and an international le level at, at ISO. In fact, after the June 19th um, standardization meeting, we plan to go full force at getting CADF adopted by NIST on their list of approved standards for use in, in audit and compliance. And then in the future, looking at ISO, IC38, there's, they're just getting over their vocabulary definitions for cloud and things. But we have many companies looking out for us there to make sure CADF is, is first and foremost in terms of auditing at an ISO level as well. So what's cool about the CADF event model, we, if you've, everyone's familiar with um, crime shows, CSI, we say CADF provides a CSI for clouds. Long gone are the days, back in the early days of, of police work, where, where a, a police officer goes to a scene of a crime and 
throws some you know, evidence in a box and tosses it away and throws it over the wall. That's like logging today. What they need to do is they have a guidebook. They bring in crime scene investigators who know how to fill out the data. They know when they pick up a piece of evidence, where it goes in the data, so that when somebody down the line gets that data, they know how to make heads or tails of it. And we call it the seven W's. It answers the seven questions for, for investigators or compliance or auditors need to know. What happened? When did it happen? Who did what? Where was the, where was the target of the event? On what was the resource that was the uh, object of the, of the action being committed? And from where and to where? What are the hosts involved? Are they coming from some location or some application uh, to, to initiate or, or go through some application to target? So all these things are pres prescribed in, in CADF, again, from you can provide some very basic things or very precise things. Uh, if you look at this, this is the architecture chart, not to go too deeply, you'll see this in action in Gordon's demonstration. But this shows an instance of what we do in terms of the WSGI framework. We, we, in Havana, we, had, we actually missed the design summit. So we went to Gordon, who was in Solometer, and we said, and we, we understood that we, how to do this non-invasively. We know we want to store things and, and log them, and we know Solometer is great at doing notifications and recording and monitoring events, and how do we do this? So we decided to design it as a WSGI middleware filter, and we actually have a configuration file, so any component non-invasively can add this to their pipeline, configure it through, through a simple configuration file to, to tell how they want to map precisely their, their events, if they want to change what our default mappings, which we have default mappings for all components, they can, they can tailor that a bit, they can actually uh, change how we do uh, different uh, time stamping, how we annotate some of the IDs and things like that. A very nice way of doing it. Uh, in terms of the bottom part of it, you can see you can go to traditional Solometer supported data stores as metadata, so we actually have people in IBM who use that data out of the database directly. But more importantly, in our demo, you'll see we actually use a dispatcher. So again, in Havana, we had a different blueprint where we actually can dispatch certain times of events to a different location. So we actually can send CADF JSON uh, uh, messages over HTTP to a security intelligence product in the case IBM is, is QRadar. And we actually can send CADF events directly to an intelligence product to make uh, um, customer-defined analytical analysis of the data coming in. So with that, uh, well, actually, I'll show you so you can actually peruse this later. We'll post the slides uh, likely on, on the uh, on OpenStack website uh, under Solometer, probably, so you can see these things. But you can see how the data is, is how we answer the seven Ws. It's color coded. But we also have ex extensibility. So we actually, uh, you can actually add tags to your data. You can add, actually add additional attributes if you want to, and we tell you exactly where to add them. But the things that are prescriptive. Are the, are the things that are, are match the seven W's on the side. So with that, you can see some of this, that's the actual kind of data that we produced from the demo. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gordon to tell you what's, uh, what we're gonna show. Um, so at IBM, we created this demo for uh, hybrid cloud security intelligence using CADF. Um, so what we did was we took a security information and event management tool. In IBM's case, we used QRadar and we had it set up to track and receive events from multiple cloud offerings, including OpenStack. Um, so regarding OpenStack specifically, what we did was we took the audit events that we, the CADF audit events that are generated by OpenStack and we collected it using Solometer and we dispatched it to QRadar. And now I'm gonna show you a quick video of one of the scenarios, I think. Just to highlight the scenario, um, in the video you're gonna see a developer who has permission to deploy applications to their company's cloud, um, and that person's terminated. And as their final act, the, user, the developer with valid credentials will attempt to destroy the company's application instances on OpenStack. And what we did is we set up QRAR to detect uh, suspicious activities such as this. So this is a video um, of a user logging into OpenStack and deleting multiple instances. So every event, or these actions, when you trigger them in OpenStack, they actually generate CADF events, which are tracked and received by QRadar or whatever uh, security information event management tool you use. Uh, you don't need sound. Oh. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is just deleting multiple instances. 
And we're going to jump over to QRadar. Uh, here's a view of the log activities, and you can see a bunch of logs that we track. Uh, those ones we're highlighting right now are the delete events. Uh, we track and audit uh, over 100 uh, events in OpenStack, and th this is just a collection of them. And if we jump over to the dashboard, um, it gives us like an aggregated view of the events from not just OpenStack, but also AWS or any other cloud offerings you're tracking. Um, that just called out some high-level, high-interest events that you can set up. You can also set up uh, certain offenses to throw out warnings or trigger actions based on certain, if certain conditions are met. So in this case, we set up uh, offense to track the condition where multiple instances are deleted. And you can dive in and see what users uh, triggered these actions and what type of events kind of caused the offense to be triggered. This is QRadar. Um, yeah, it's our standard. It works with any OpenStack distribution that's generating CADF. So there's no vendor lock-in. It just, you know, if you you have something from Red Hat or somewhere else, and then you just flip the config switch in uh, the file, it generates the events, and you can, you know, to our tool or other people's tools. You know, I, just to, I just wanted to point out here that people think of auditing in terms of things that go wrong, things that fail. In this demo, we're actually looking at things that are working the way they're supposed to from the surface that a user has the correct permission, they have access control to terminate images, but during some period of time, they, they know they're going to get fired. And they decide to terminate in rapid succession uh, 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 instances that they have the full access and right to do. So they wouldn't appear as a failure, they wouldn't have a big red flag around them. But in terms of intelligence, we can look at successful messages and say, well, if a, if a single user terminates this many instances with a given period of time, that's suspicious. We want to look at that and flag that. So that's what you see here. It, it's it's built actually PyCatF is actually built into his library to Oslo messaging, so it's 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 a nice house. It's built in anywhere. So this this audit filter, it can be activated out of out of um, OpenStack the way it ships today. You just have to add it to your middleware filter as via config file. Right. Yeah. So you can pull in the PyCatF library and just kind of build your own events. Yeah. Wherever which for whatever project you're using. Um, so I guess talking this slide again. Um, Relating back to the seven Ws that Matt was talking about, one of the things I noticed while working with the QR team is when I gave them a, a list of the of, uh, OpenStack events, they were easily able to map the OpenStack events to their own internal format just because of the way the CADF model was set up. It answers a lot of the same questions that a security tool, a security intelligence tool needed, like who, who triggered the event, like when it happened, or, on what, or what target the event was uh, triggered on. And it, like, we gave them a whole list of events, and they were easily able to map those events to QRadar. Uh, uh, for this slide, this just kind of reiterates some of the stuff I was talking about before. Um, when we did the demo, we were tracking not just OpenStack, but also Amazon and a bunch of other cloud offerings like VMware. And you can kind of aggregate all those results into one view and kind of pick out the, the uh, values of high interest to you. And now I'll pass it on to Rob. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the future and what I see happening. I had a chance to go to Monitorama last week. And uh, there were a lot of ops people there. And uh, one of the things that was commented on is, you know, we're stressed. <laughs> You know, a lot of the ops people were saying, hey, this is a stressful job. It, it's hard. And did I miss something on my monitor? So, you know, they're, they're watching a screen. And, you know, am I sure what this means? You know, there's just, uh, it's not always clear um, in all cases what to do. So this diagram kind of shows maybe some of the different roles that, um, you know, an ops person needs to take. They do security. They do, um, you know, they keep OpenStack going, kind of like a butler. 
So I've got, you know, my, my soldier and butler here and all sorts of different things they need to do. And uh, one of the things we need to start to think about is how do we make this less stressful for our ops people and how can we turn over some of the ops work um, over to computers so where, you know, they're not having to do it all. Um, I will tell you that I must confess I'm not a big security person. I'm not an audit expert, auditing expert like these guys are. Um, but I did um, become acquainted with the CADF standard um, about the middle of last year, maybe third quarter. And um, I immediately saw, hey, there's some really nice things about this that apply to more than just um, security intelligence that, like was said earlier, for operational intelligence, for operations, this is a terrific standard. And if you think across all the tiers that an ops person needs to play, you can see all the way down from the hardware up through the apps and the different layers, what's going on? How do I know what's going on with all these different events and all these heterogeneous formats? And what do I do about it? What's actionable on this? I, I think one of the key benefits that um, you'll that I envisioned in this is instead of having this cacophony of, you know, uh, heterogeneous events on all these different tiers in all these different formats, what if we could start to standardize on something more common across all these tiers? I I'm not saying that we're going to get our hardware anytime soon to re-change IPMI, that's not the point. And I don't think you need to actually do the normalization in the you know, in the layer that's um, originating the event in all cases, you can normalize it elsewhere. But the point is, as you normalize all this, two things happen. One is, if you are a human being and you get used to a very logical taxonomy that which this has, CADF has, it was, you know, something that I picked up in in a couple weeks, I understood it, it was nice. But then the second thing that I understood was, uh, you know, came to understand is, wait a minute, this is written in such a way that I can turn some of this work over to something other than a human being. I can feed this back up into some analysis loop and now autonomically take care of some of these things. Much easier to do than if you have a whole bunch of events in different formats that are missing pieces of data. And, and here's my experience coming out of this. Here's my experience coming out of this. As we look at all the different things we need to do in our space, from being the telescope, high speed camera setting, the wide angle lens, the microscope, we have all these different views we need, and we need to build this up. As we start to impose CADF on people, they realize they're missing data. They realize they weren't disciplined in generating the event in the first place. So point number one I wanna make is, CADF as a standard is a great discipline, even if you don't, let's say you don't even follow the standard. If you just read this and think about, did I answer all these questions, and I don't care what format it is, you've done a really good thing right there by using the standard to discipline. And what we've found is as we've gone through with various groups that have already generated events or, or who are thinking about generating events, we have found consistently problems where they haven't been doing the seven W's, and they get it. They totally get it, and they say, you're right, we're missing data, and, and they fix things. So that's point number one. Point number two, once they do start going to CADF format, it's just like um, uh, uh, Gordon and Matt was saying, as soon as you go to CADF and you start doing this, you start finding that it's much easier to incorporate other people that also are doing CADF either from the top or the bottom. So um, I, I, I'm a different product, not OpenStack, but related to OpenStack, and I wanted to integrate with QRadar. And the QRadar guy told me this week, he said, you're CADF? No problem, it's covered. And I said, well, what's the sizing? Do I need to go to your planner and integrate it? He said, no, it's a no-brainer, it's free. <laughs> So that was great news for me from a product adoption standpoint to be able to go to guys like QRadar and, and get in there free. 
point no, from the bottom side, where I'm on the bottom, uh, uh, have somebody on the bottom, the same thing. If, um, as they look at adopting cat F underneath me, I found out, again, much easier to adopt in. So on, on multiple axes, it just makes um, the job easier. And then the last point I wanted to make is in terms of just um, versatility. What I've found with this, um, with this standard is I've been able to apply it across a broad degree of di disciplines. I, I, I did this in terms of camera settings, but you know that when you're scaling up and out, you're looking at certain things in terms of what you're monitoring and what you're looking for. Um, when you're down there looking at dynamics, it's a different set of of metrics or things you're looking for. Um, and then orchestration across multiple tiers, and then also down focusing on these issues. We're working on all these problems right now, and I'm able to um, apply this across all those tiers. The advantage of doing this is, is that as you start to apply CATF across all these tiers, you see interactions and integration points that were just basically if they weren't literally impossible, they were practically impossible because of the, the, the barriers of the not having a standard. So um, I, my point is, is that I see a bright future for CATF. I see a broad and deep future for CATF. And I think it, I see um, some of the answers to the problems we need to solve for our ops administrators to make their job of understanding things better and then to being able to autonomically offload. Any questions? So what we did is, if you look at the architecture chart, is we're, we're basically creating a, a notification channel. So it's a named channel uh, for, for audit events. And what you do is, like, if you want to use Solometer, you can actually, we actually can change Solometer to dispatch the, just those audit tagged or labeled events that in that channel to, to your product of choice or to your log of choice. Or you can actually just let Solometer do its job and uh, the CATF format will be added to the metadata in the, in the Solometer uh, database. So you can choose to do it through there. And we, you know, we, we have plans to do things also. I know that we have another slide. I don't know if we're going to show it, are we? So in, in, you know, we, we've, uh, we think that in terms of monitoring and future use cases and do some of these autonomous things, um, we, we're going to do, use CATF as a normative format for StackTac. Um, and, and so you can actually go to a normative log so that actually CATF is actually indexed as part of a database. So you can do some really cool API things against it, and we'd like to have, you know, CATF is not going to be the only format for StackTac, but it'll be the normative format that you can get data out and in by, and we're going to actually hopefully look at the, the storage format, the indexing, and, and tell people how to construct queries that are based on CATF semantics. Yeah, so kind of, uh, and uh, thanks for bringing this up. I mean, I got carried away. Um, no, thank you. Um, what I wanted to show here is, is um, you know, when we're talking about enterprise monitoring, there's some, you know, characteristics of enterprise monitoring here. And I'm not saying that it, an enterprise monitoring solution has to have all of these characteristics, but it certainly has, will have some of these. So as you go through here and you look at these, um, enterprise characteristics, um, we feel like we need um, 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 the capability of both of these together in a complementary fashion in, in order to, to um, uh, take care of our use cases. And back to your point about Logstash, because I, I like Logstash too, what I'd like to see, and, and maybe we can release, I don't know, talk about afterwards is, talk about after the session is releasing a CATF 
um, Logstash uh, standard query set that every, anybody could use who uses Logstash. And yeah, he's nodding his head. I, I, I like that notion too. And you know, it's something that's, that, uh, you know, now once you get that, then you're not really worried about the path at all and you can start right there in Logstash at all the autonomics and all the hooks you want for your admin too. Other uh, questions? Oh, Adam Young with Red Hat. I was wondering if you guys are working with the, uh, the base platform folks in coming up with better emission for CADAF from, I'm thinking specifically ABCs from SC Linux and from you know, the base platform type events so that we can get you know, a unified audit from top to bottom. So I, I have had some discussions with folks in it, both Intel and then our uh, power platforms. But I, I think that you're on a good point that we probably need to move that to a broader community than just the, you know, that uh, narrow set to more like something you say like SE Linux to, again, cover, um, if you look at all these tiers, there's a lot of different people we need to talk to. And we're, I, I'm kind of spiraling out from OpenStack, which is kind of where this has started, and, and we're spiraling our way out and meeting it. But I will tell you that the interesting thing is, is I talk to people in general, I, the, the, the acceptance of, of this is a, is a solid event model is, is, is consistent. In other words, like me, which I, I saw this about six months ago, as I talk to people about this and I say, look this over and come back to me, they say, yeah, Rob, this is a good solid standard. It's something we can, we can build on. And, and I, your point taken, and, and we will be doing that, we're not there yet, but, but it's, it's on the plans. Okay, yes. Did you guys consider including the policy that was in force when that operate when this log event was generated? Yeah, actually, actually I didn't. It's in the slides, so there, you know, people think of uh, term things in terms of activity events. We also have things called control events. And if you have a control event, you actually have a place to normally put your, your policies, even reference like a policy, if we go to like some policy standard in Keystone, and we want to manage against those policies, and we have rules that are actually programmatically executed in those, those policies, we have places to put the policy data as well. So, so, so think about this. You've got an, you have an autom autonomic engine. It's got sh your policies and controls going into it, and then the results coming out the back. Think about it. I was asking about the policies it being embedded in the results, so that when I look at a log message or when I do analytics, I know what should be, what the enforcement was, as opposed to I now have to go look at another tool to say, you know, if this something was denied, for example, or an operation failed, did it fail because of policy or did it fail because I have some well, other issue? Well, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, the, the problem, it, we want CADAP to be lean and mean to provide just the essential data. We didn't want event bloat, okay? okay? So our placeholders for now for policy, there's a place to place policy IDs and rule IDs, things like that. So you would have to go to another tool, but we ex expect that with an open stack, those IDs will be easily accessible and be able to look up those policies within a keystone or something like that in the future. Um, but if you want to, if you want to add policies or other things directly, we have a way to extend the, the data. You can add extra attributes. Uh, you can add those things into If you want to create an aggregation tool, you create something on that dispatcher on the back end that gets the CADAP events with the ID, you can write your own little tool that goes off to Keystone or wherever, looks at the policy and embeds it in if you want before you send it off to someplace else. Yeah, so you should be able to go into Logstash, right? And you should be able to, if you're s smart about it, be able to identify all the events associated with a policy. So in other words, if you have all kinds of different multi-tenants and different policies for different tenants, you can kind of have your policy there and, and pull it together with your log stash without having to append it to every event should be doable. So if you have pointers or it's, uh, let's just say it's referenceable elsewhere, do you also include any level of integrity protection for any dereferences that takes place? Well, that's beyond the scope of the CADAF specification right now. 
And when you talk about integrity levels, that's an ambiguous thing unless there is something to match it against because different people have tried to define integrity levels and those are kind of all relative to whatever body is defining those things. So it, that's something we didn't want to go into because that's something we couldn't be prescriptive about. But there's, you know, there's place if you have some measurement of those things, you want to add them to, to your CATF, to the CATF events that come out of OpenStack as, as custom data where you can evaluate and you can tell your customers we have this integrity scale or risk-based scale or whatever. You can add those tags, you can add those things, you can create those views using CATF as a way to create those views. Hi. Okay, uh, one question, a question to, uh, to you guys, like uh, you, you guys are collecting lots of data, so uh, for audit data, so how this audit data can be lead to like some sort of compliance? Uh, for example, such against HIPAA or ISO, how do I use this data uh, to achieve compliance? Well, it, it, you know, basically you feed into different compliance frameworks. So CATF was designed to, to support any compliance framework. So it goes back again to the tags. So if you deem something to be critical, like an authentication event from Keystone uh, or, or an event from, uh, from Nova, and you deem that as part of a compliance regimen that you know have a, some ID that maps to some compliance framework of some kind, you can add that tag in. That's, that's the goal. So you can flag it so when it goes to Logstash or whatever else, that tag is there. Yeah. Uh, this will be a yes, but if I Google for CADF, I'll find these types of slides and stuff, right? Cool. And you probably said this in the beginning, but I wasn't paying enough attention then. What does CADF stand for? Well, it's a long story. We just wanted to beat Cloud Auditing Working Group, Cloud Auditing Standard, but somebody else had dibs on that name. So by, by, by um, group decision, they just decided to make us Cloud Audit Data Federation because what we really were working at was a use case that Brad described at the onset of today, which is this is federated data. We want people to be mindful that this data was being merged and aggregated from hybrid sources. So we added the DF, so CATF turned out nice. So can, can this work with OpenStack Havana, or is it something we need to upgrade to Icehouse for? Gor well, I'll let Gordon answer. You got Havana. How much is in Havana? How much support in Havana? Uh, so I think in Havana right now, there's support for Nova. Um, and then in Icehouse, we expanded that to Keystone a little bit. Um, but we're still kind of looking to expand the support beyond, like, the core projects. What's the core pro I guess what needs to happen in each project to support it? So I mean, if it's just kind of generically interpreting API requests and sending them to a topic somewhere. Yeah, so you just have to pull in the PyCatF library and then you can there's a I think a event factory and you can build whatever event you need and then it'll send it to the message bus and whatever. Thanks. On that, you know, so I mentioned early on, might, might have gotten missed, is that we were publishing a CATF OpenStack profile at DMTF. The majority of that profile is an appendix that has a mapping for every API in Cinder, Glance, Keystone, whatever, in the back of the appendix. So we, we actually have anticipated doing, have, have a CATF library and things set up to do all these things and how we would do it. I think it's more a matter of testing and adoption on a product by product basis. We, you can turn us on. We, we would rather be sanctioned and be built in and part of every project, so. What, what I'm hearing is that we're, we're getting more data from these events, right? So the, is the overhead, is that in any way significant in terms of what needs to be stored or network performance or something like that? Well, you know, there's also, you know, Gordon's done some great work in terms of configuration files. You can actually control um, which events you want to turn on or off. You can turn them on or off for components. You can turn them on and off for on, a, on, a, on, a, on an API type of, uh, basis. But um, you, know, you have a separate channel. That's why you use a dispatcher. So we actually don't have to flood the Solometer database, who's doing metering billing nicely, uh, with tens of thousands of events if we're going to do monitoring at that level. We can actually dispatch just those channel events to a separate product if we want to as well. So there are different knobs and levers you can turn on off to, to, control, to control the events that get generated and where they get sent. OK, thank you. I wonder if that draft profile is available yet, or is that coming soon? Um, I can make it available to, to anybody. It'll be posted probably on the DMTF website this month. 
I think that with OpenStack Summit coming up, we, we kind of delayed it. So I'm hoping to spend this month, we'll have it posted on the DMTF website. All right, thank you for all the questions and interest. And uh, you, uh, just any of us, you run into us, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more personally about this as, as long as you want to talk. It's a subject I like talking about. Thank you.